Unleavened Bread Ministries presents Panoramic Bible Studies with David Eels. Hello, and God bless you, saints. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Unleavened Bread Bible Study. Father, we just ask you to encourage us today in faith. Encourage us that you answer prayers, and especially with fasting, Lord. I'd like you to encourage, Father, the brethren concerning fasting, what power it is with you, according to the Scriptures. And Lord, we just thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I think I'm going to start in Jonah. And um, you pretty much know the story. Jonah was ordered by God to go to Nineveh to preach to that great city. And he didn't want to go. He didn't want to go because it was the enemy of his people, of God's people. And he knew God would be merciful and gracious and repent of the evil that he had uh, threatened them with. So anyway, you know the story. He was in the boat. They had to throw him out of the boat to keep the boat from sinking. And um, God had prepared a great fish to swallow him up. And he was in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights. And he was crying out to the Lord while he was fasting. (laughs) I know the pictures that the kids have of Jonah in the belly of the whale uh, cooking a fish over the fire. Well, I don't believe it. (laughs) He said he had seaweed wrapped around his head and he was crying out for his life the time he was down there. He was highly motivated. (laughs) And so God had the fish spit him out on the shore and vomit him out on the shore, as a matter of fact. He must have been pretty bad tasting. And um, he was just um, crying out for his life, right? And like I said, I believe he was fasting because I don't think he had anything else on his mind. But the Lord heard him and had mercy on him and spit him out. And I'm going to start in chapter 3 here. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. This time he was highly motivated. Saying, Arise and go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God which was a mighty miracle. You know, I know that the people of Nineveh knew about Israel and knew about their God, but they were pagans. And don't you know that God is the one who makes pagans believe? By grace have you been saved through faith, right? And that's not of yourselves. It's a gift from God. So if you need faith or you know someone that's a pagan that needs faith, well, pray for them because God has that power to change people's minds. He did a whole city that way. The people of Nineveh believed God and they proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even unto the least of them. Now that's amazing. God must have put that in their heart. But I want to tell you, in the old world, a lot of people believed in fasting. 
even pagans believed in fasting. And sometimes God answered their prayers, as the Bible says, not just in this point, but in other places. Sometimes God answered their prayers. And uh, because if anybody's willing up, willing to give up their flesh in order to cry out to God in repentance, he's listening. Now, people say, of course, and the scriptures does say, too, that... Um, God doesn't hear the prayers of the wicked. But I want to tell you one prayer that he does hear from them, and that is the prayer of repentance. And it was real repentance because they were willing to fast. You know how hard it is to get people to fast and how much of a great reputation fasting has. Well, the whole bunch of them must have really believed God because they put on sackcloth, and they fasted from the greatest of them to the least of them. That's an amazing miracle, but it shows you what God can do. I'll tell you what the Lord told me about this parable of Jonah speaking to Nineveh, which was the head of the Assyrian Empire, in just a few minutes. But first, I want to share the rest of this chapter with you. And the tidings reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he made a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd, nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. Uh, wow, the, even the critters couldn't eat or drink water. But he proclaimed a fast to all of Nineveh that they would neither eat nor drink. But let them be covered with sackcloth, both man and beast, and let them cry mightily unto God, fasting and praying. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Well, that's very interesting. You know, we've talked about the different kinds of fasting, the spiritual fast, and the physical fast. Some people are convinced that there's only a spiritual fast today and, and that the physical fast is not important. And many preachers preach against fasting, even saying that it will harm you and so on and so forth, which is a bunch of ridiculous stuff, you know. But anyway, we see here that the foundation for this physical fast was a spiritual fast, which is what? Not feeding the flesh, not giving in to your flesh so that it grows, right? You know the story of the, the black dog and the white dog? I've shared it before. It's one that's well known, I think, that uh, a person fenced up a black dog and a white dog, and he fed the black dog and starved the white dog, and he turned them loose, and they fought, and of course, the black dog won. And then he fed the white dog and starved the black dog, and the white dog won. And the parable of the story, of course, is that if you feed your spiritual man what he needs to grow, He'll be strong and win the battle. And if you feed your carnal man, the black dog, what he needs to grow, uh, he will win the battle. And so it is. Here, they're fasting. They're denying their flesh the food it needs or wants, let me say, which is a hard thing for man to do. He's pretty prone to feed his flesh. But also, they have turned everyone from his evil way 
and from the violence that is in his hands, which is a spiritual fast. At the bottom of every physical fast that's successful and has power with God is a spiritual fast uh, of denying yourself. What good does it do to grant mercy and grace to someone who is headlong after serving their flesh and being a demon in this earth? It does no good whatsoever. God knows it. And so I say at the bottom of every physical fast that's successful is a spiritual fast of denying yourself, not feeding your flesh. Amen? And uh, verse 9 says, Who knoweth whether God will not turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil which he said he would do unto them, and he did it not. Well, praise the Lord. You know, chapter 4 and verse 1 says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray, O Lord, Pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I hasted to flee unto Tarshish. He knew they were going to repent. He was going to have mercy. He said, I knew that thou wert a gracious God and a merciful, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. How much evil has come upon you? Does God hear your prayers if you show him that you really want to turn away from evil? See, many people just want God to hear their prayers, but they don't want to turn away from evil. They don't want to quit feeding their flesh. But when you show God that you're ready to sacrifice your old man, your flesh, there's power with God. Fasting is a, a proof to God that you're going to deny yourself, deny your flesh. You're not going to feed your flesh. And if you're desperate enough, as they believed that they were about to be destroyed in 40 days, you're motivated enough to do something before God. You may have some thing in your life that is bigger than you are uh, or in your family's life that is bigger than you are or your spiritual family's life that's bigger than you are and you need power with God. The Scripture declares that fasting is power with God. And uh, so I exhort you to believe God's examples, I'll share a few of them with you, and fast and pray. You know there is a great enemy being raised up against the people of God in these days. Even Jesus said you'll be hated of all nations for his namesake. And I want you to know that fasting and prayer in the scriptures is a power over your enemies and a power with God. And He will deliver you. Now, I told you I'd share this parable with you that the Lord showed me years ago, and briefly I will. The full story of it is in Hidden Manna for the End Times. But basically, the Lord showed me in a vision in 1996 as I was standing over the Gulf of Mexico looking at America, he showed me a vision of Nineveh as America. And um, I'm just going to give you the brief part of it. But And then I looked up over America and I saw this gigantic bomb hanging over America. And it was tied up there with a string in a bow knot that could be released at any moment. Now that's living on the edge, right? 
Well, at that time, America was. A lot of prophets were going forth and prophesying to America that judgment was coming. And I want to tell you that God delayed that judgment. It's even written in the Bible codes that God delayed that judgment for more than one purpose, not just because many of the people of God believed and repented who were the important people and called out to God, but because, like Jonah knew, uh, Nineveh was going to be the enemy of his people and would end up uh, bringing his people basically to their cross. And that happened. Just a few years later, 64 years later, I believe, if I remember correctly, because God had mercy and delayed his judgment upon Nineveh, 64 years later, they conquered his people. At the head of the Assyrian Empire, they conquered God's people because God's people were in apostasy as they are today. Well, God showed me Nineveh as America. God had mercy on America at that time so that down the road, America would bring Christians, God's people, and the Jews too, I might add, to their cross. Now, we're looking out there and we're seeing that cross being assembled. We're seeing that this nation has been turning against God, the true God, and uh, against the Christians. We're seeing plans to bring Christians to their cross. Not going to get into that right now, but God showed me that Nineveh, the judgment of Nineveh, would be delayed just like the judgment of America would be delayed, and it was. I started telling people in 1998 when this revelation was made plain to me. In other words, the interpretation of it was made plain to me that I, I did not tell everybody at that time, but I did shortly thereafter that the judgment that was prophesied to come on America in the year 2000 or by 2000 was not going to happen. And I know I sent that out to a lot of prophets and they listened and they believed and they ceased preaching that, you know. And, but the thing was, it was only delayed until the time of the tribulation. And just before the tribulation, we see these things happening now where the country and the world is turning against Christianity and I might add the Jews, because there's a remnant of Jews who is going to be grafted back in to the vine, which is Christianity, the olive tree, which is Christianity. Now, there is no other covenant with God, so just forget it if you think they've got another covenant with God. There is only one covenant with God. It's the new covenant, as the Bible clearly states. But America's judgment was delayed until they brought God's people into tribulation. And that's about to happen. And at the end of that tribulation is when Nineveh was destroyed. At the end of the tribulation that they brought God's people into, they were destroyed. The same is true of America. At the end of this tribulation that they're about to bring not only the Christians in America, but the Christians and Jews worldwide, you're going to see it. You're going to see it. At the end of this tribulation, this country is going to be destroyed. It's going to be destroyed as we know it. And um, the parable, I prophesied that back then, and now... America is starting to bring Christians under bondage, taking away from them the rights that they've had, etc., etc. It's beginning to happen. And it's going to be fulfilled. I'm just as sure as what God showed me. It's going to be fulfilled. 
you know what? In this coming tribulation, you are going to need to know power with God in prayer by fasting. You're going to need to know this, and I'm going to prove it to you. And I've been a faster since I was very young in the Lord. Over 40 years ago, I started fasting. I fasted every week. Even while I was working, I would fast several days during the week. And uh, I found that it gave me wisdom from God. It gave me power with God. I found that the fasting prayer with faith was very powerful. It impressed me. And on and off, ever since then, I have fasted. And I, I firmly believe in it. And I wish I would have done a study on this for people. I have studied with people um, somewhat over the years with it, but I wish I would have done a broader study way back when. But the Lord has impressed me today to do this. So I want to look at something else here. Let's look at um, Isaiah chapter 58. Now some people think that this spiritual fast negates the physical fast, but I want to prove to you that that's not so. Okay? Uh, I'll just start in verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and declare unto my people their transgression, and to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily, and delight to know my ways. I think he's being a little facetious here. He, um, he is telling Isaiah to declare unto them their transgressions, and he's about to get into that even more. But it says, as, I would underline the word as there, <clears throat> as a nation that did righteousness. He didn't say they were one, but they were as one, and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments, like they were deserving of them, right? They delight to draw near unto God. But now, listen to what he says. Wherefore, have we fasted, or they said, have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou knowest, and thou takest no knowledge? Afflicted our soul. Well, you know, notice from the attitude here, they knew that fasting was powerful with God. They knew that fasting got God's attention. Notice that. Wherefore have we fasted? say they, and thou seest not. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, which of course he's talking about your suke, your, the soulish part of man, which is fleshly, it's taken on the image and nature of the flesh, and thou takest no knowledge. In other words, what? What, Lord? I mean, we're fasting and praying, and you're not listening. You know, they knew that this was unusual. And the problem was them, of course. And the Lord says, Behold, in the day of your fast you find your own pleasure and exact all your labors. And actually, some versions actually say, oppress all your laborers. So they weren't they weren't after God's will. They didn't want to please God. They weren't fasting and praying for the good things. They had a bad attitude. They were living in the flesh. They, the black dog was winning. And, and uh, he said, you find your own pleasure. In other words, the, the old man's pleasure and exact all your labors. Behold, you fast for strife and contention and to smite with the fist of wickedness. You fast not this day 
so as to make your voice to be heard on high. There it is. The Lord admits that fasting is to make your voice be heard on high. Okay. But notice they had a bad foundation. They weren't ceasing from their own works. They were feeding the black dog. They weren't spiritually fasting. They were physically fasting, but they didn't have the foundation of a spiritual fast. They were not denying their flesh. Of course, you know, in the natural, fasting is not feeding your flesh, right? But in the spiritual fast, it's the same thing, not feeding your old man, not feeding your fleshly man, right? Denying your self. Self is a good word. They were not denying themselves. So it's good to physically deny your flesh and to spiritually deny your flesh if you want your voice to be heard on high, the Lord is saying. And, of course, they wanted to fight with flesh and blood, and we're not called to do that. We're forbidden to fight with flesh and blood, but with the principalities and powers and the rulers of this darkness, right? We're to love our enemies. We're to turn the other cheek. We're to resist not him that is evil. We're told to resist the devil, but resist, resist not him that is evil. These are God's words, right? This, these are ways that we deny ourselves. This is the right attitude. We're to love our enemies, etc. Okay? So, he says, you're not fasting in such a way as to make me hear your voice. Is such the fast that I have chosen? Well, no. What was the real problem here? The real problem was their attitude. That there was a fleshly fast. They were not trying to please God. They were not humbling themselves. You know, in a fast, you're humbling your flesh. You're saying no to the flesh and yes to God. Is such the fast that I have chosen, the day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head with a, as a rush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast? Now, what did he rebuke them for? He rebuked them for their rebellion against God, their self-will. He's saying, you don't fast this day to be heard. Oh, yeah, you can do all this. You can bow your head as a rush, and you can spread sackcloth under you. But will you call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Well, he wanted them to let the oppressed go free. He wanted them to turn the other cheek. He wanted them to be obedient to him. And, you know, if this was to negate a physical fast, you'd have to negate the whole New Testament. Let me point it out to you. In Luke chapter 4, 1 through 14, and we'll come back, okay? And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led in the Spirit in the wilderness during 40 days, being tempted of the devil. He needed the power of God, didn't he? 40 days in the wilderness being tempted of the devil. If you're being tempted of the devil, you know what you can do? You can do what Jesus did. And he did eat nothing in those days. And when they were completed, he hungered. He ate nothing during those days of temptation of the devil. And you know what? He had the victory. He had power from God. You know, the Bible says he was tempted in all points like as we, yet without sin. Well, that's, there's reasons behind that. Here's one of them. Do you think Jesus would have fasted if he didn't need to? Do you think he would have done a physical fast if he believed the only fast that was left unto him was a spiritual fast? Well, no. No, he is a 
speaking against that doctrine. And the devil said unto him, If thou art the Son of God, command this stone that it become bread. In other words, go ahead and feed your flesh. Do a miracle. Feed your flesh. And Jesus answered unto him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. Well, that's true. People who have fasted know that. <laughs> they know that. Uh, you know, I've fasted, and I, I can tell you that if I fast with water or without water, uh, but without food, after three days, I start feeling better. Uh, in the first few days, I feel rather weak. But after that, I start feeling better. For, uh, I lose my appetite. And uh, the fast is, is more easily upheld. And I can tell you that you can fast for long periods of time, and you'll live by the power of God. I've gone for long periods of time even without water. And people said, oh, after three days, you'll die. Well, let me tell you, that won't happen. I've gone for weeks without water. And I got to tell you that in the Bible, people have gone for a month or 40 days, actually, without water. That's a, a, a fast that God was supporting by his power because man can't go that long without water. So man doesn't live by bread alone, but by everything that comes out of the mouth of God, right? And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, the devil said unto him, To thee will I give all this authority. And it's not as though Jesus d knew that he didn't have that authority. He did. His servant you are whom you obey. When man obeyed the devil, they gave authority to the devil. To thee will I give all this authority and the glory of them. For it has been delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. Jesus didn't argue with him. If thou therefore wilt worship before me, it shall all be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he led him up to Jerusalem, and set him upon the pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou art the Son of God, Cast thyself down from hence, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee to guard thee. And on their hands they shall bear thee up, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not make trial of the Lord thy God. And when the devil had completed every temptation, he departed from him for a season. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and a fame went out concerning him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. What favor God gave to Jesus. And uh, he said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. What favor will he give to us? If we will deny ourselves take up our cross and follow him and pray the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man and especially with fasting Jesus deemed fasting important here and Moses did too in this similar situation both were the man childs of their day right and Moses fasted for 40 days too and Jesus considered this necessary in this temptation of the devil to overcome his enemy, right? And that's not all. Jesus taught his disciples that they needed to physically fast. For instance, Matthew 6, I would say 16 through 18. Moreover, when you fast, Jesus said, when you fast, not if you fast. Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites, of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may be seen of men to fast. Fairly I say unto you, they have received their reward. Yeah, because 
he tells them then, he says, But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head and wash thy face. In other words, let the suffering be between you and God, right? That thou be not seen of men to fast, but of thy Father who is in secret. And the Father who seeth in secret shall recompense thee. For what? For fasting. He said they would fast, and he said he would recompense them for fasting. I know a lot of good word has gone forth about prayer and prayer of faith and how not to give in to double-mindedness, but uh, like Jesus said, all things whatsoever you pray and ask for, believe you received them and you shall have them. Mark 11 and 24. Powerful words that have to do with receiving answers from God. But here's one too, and a promise that he will recompense you for fasting. Amen. So, once again, we can look, for instance, in Matthew chapter 9. I'm, I'll look at 14 and 15 here. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the sons of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then will they fast. Well, you know, the bridegroom was taken away, was he not? We don't even see him here today. He said, and then will they fast. So the Lord said we would fast, and the Lord said he would recompense that fast. Okay? So now, would the Lord do anything wrong? Would his disciples do anything wrong? Would he tell us to physically fast when we don't have a physical fast anymore? No, he wouldn't. And that's not what this is talking about in Isaiah 58, that the physical fast was superseded by a spiritual fast. No, they're both needed. They're both needed. But let me tell you the difference between a physical fast, it has an end. A spiritual fast has no end. You are to every day deny yourself and take up your cross and follow Jesus. You are to every day feed the spiritual man and not the carnal man. Every day. What he was rebuking them here for is their attitude behind the physical fast. And he was telling them that was what was wrong. And that was why they were not fasting to be heard, he said. So he tells you to put this spiritual fast behind your physical fast. Verse 6, Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness and to undo the bands of the yoke? All this is talking about repentance. The same thing we just studied in Jonah, right? And to let the oppressed go free. The, the Jews were bad about holding debts against people. You remember Jesus in Matthew 18 warned us that if you don't forgive every man their debt, that his heavenly Father will turn us over to the tormentors. He didn't say he would hear your prayers or your fasting or anything else. And that you break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? Hey, this is better than a spiritual fast. Take the food that you would eat and give it to somebody that needs it. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? And that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house. This is fasting with the right attitude. Fasting to deny yourself, fasting to deny your flesh, not only your physical flesh, but your spiritual flesh, right? There is a spiritual fast behind the physical fast. And when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, 
Thy healing shall spring forth speedily. Notice, people need healing. And some people are even fasting for healing. But they're not fasting in fulfilling the parable of the fast, which is don't feed your flesh. Deny yourself, right? He said, Thy healing shall spring forth speedily if you do the spiritual fast beneath the physical fast. And thy righteousness shall go before thee. Some people fast for righteousness or deliverance from evil. Same thing, right? But do you want your prayer to be heard by God? He's telling you the way for your prayer to be heard by God. There has to be repentance with a fast. The glory of the Lord shall be thy rearward. In other words, he'll protect you from behind, right? as he did with the children of Israel when they went through the wilderness. He pecked them from behind. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord will answer. Thou shalt cry, and he will say, Here I am. Oh, well, that's a reward for your fasting, is it not? Some people are critical of others. They're judgmental of others. They're unforgiving of others. They're quick to judge. So he says, If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking wickedly. Okay, so here's part of repentance. Cease from judging and pointing your finger at others. Take away from the midst of thee the yoke. He's talking about a yoke you've put upon yourself and a yoke you've put upon others by speaking against them wickedly. And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul. In other words, see to the needs of others. Give of yourself to others' needs, right? Fasting is great when you take what you would have consumed and give it to others, right? Then shall thy light rise in the darkness and thine obscurity be as the noonday. Well, now, that would be just awesome for God's people to glow in the dark, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, a little light goes a long ways when it's in darkness, right? You can see it a long way off. And God wants his people to be a light. He doesn't want them to hide their light under a bushel, right? He wants them to be a light. And the Lord will guide thee continually. That's awesome. You want the guidance of God? Fast so that you'll be heard, spiritually and physically. He will guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in dry places and make strong thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. How many Christians do you know that get dried up and fail? First is the sin that you're, you're seeing that the Lord is correcting, but also the lack of prayer and the lack of effectual fervent prayer. Part of, part of that is fasting. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places, and thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Now, a fast is like a Sabbath. You cease from your works, right? There is a spiritual Sabbath in the New Testament. It's called the Sabbatismos. In Hebrews, Paul speaks of that, and it's the only time he speaks of a Sabbath for the Christians. But it, it's, it's the fulfillment of the parable of the Old Testament letter Sabbath. The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. In verse 13, he says, If thou turn away thy foot, from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure. There it is again, thy pleasure. 
he accused them of doing their own pleasure on in a fast. And that was why they were not fasting in a way to be heard from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, which is this holy day is the Sabbath, and it's a continual, Sabbatismos means a continual Sabbath. There's no day that's the Sabbath anymore. We are in the Sabbath. We continually have to cease from our works and enter into his works through faith. He that hath believed doth enter in to that rest, Paul said. The Sabbath is the rest. Resting from your works. God wants you to rest from your works. That's everything he's saying here in Isaiah 58. You want your prayers to be heard while you physically fast but spiritually don't? God says, well, you're not going to be heard like that. From doing thy pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight? No, you're not really delighting in ceasing from your works while you're still doing them. And the holy of the Lord honorable? And you think the Sabbath is being honorable if you're not ceasing from your works? No, the Sabbath was about ceasing from your works. It wasn't about the physical things. It was about all kinds of your works, works of the flesh, works of the law. Works of all kinds of negative works, right? And shall honor it by not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Like putting forth of the finger and speaking wickedly, right? So we're not to please the flesh. We're not to feed the flesh during a physical fast. We're to do just the opposite. We're to deny it. Again, the spiritual fast is forever. The physical fast is, is a temporary thing. But it gets God's attention according to his own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will make thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and I will feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. You know, if you're going to continue on in willful disobedience while you fast, expecting God to answer, or you don't fast, you just pray and expect God to answer, he's saying, no, it won't happen. Repent and believe. That's the sequence. Repent and believe. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God. If you're living under a curse, or somebody under your authority is living under a curse, you need, fasting and praying is good, as long as it has as a foundation this spiritual fast of denying yourself, denying your sin, turning back to God. Show God that you mean to be a disciple of His. Show Him. Prove it. Physical fasting is good. It is powerful if it's backed up with repentance. But he says, your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you so that he will not hear. He said, you fast not this day to be heard, for your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies. Hey, go back, straighten things out. Make things right between you and your brother. That's a spiritual fast. Go and ask forgiveness if you've lied about your brother. He said, Your tongue muttereth wickedness. Do you think God doesn't know what you're saying and what you're doing and your attitude towards others? That you're not turning the other cheek, that you're not loving your enemy, that you're not doing good to those who despitefully use you. Do you think he doesn't know? He knows the number of hairs on your head. Do you think he doesn't know? He has angels 
attending to you constantly. Do you think he doesn't know what's going on? You want something from God? You have to lose your life to gain your life. You want life from God? Lose that old life, the suke life, the soulish life. Afflict your soul with fasting. Deny yourself, and God will answer. But the Lord complains in verse 4 here, None sueth in righteousness. In other words, they don't come to Him in prayer, in righteousness. And none pleadeth in truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. This is the problem, saints. This is the problem. You probably have in your own life some desperate needs. You've been asking and asking and asking, maybe even attempting to ask in faith for these needs. But you haven't seen any results. Let me say that the whole Bible declares that fasting with prayer is powerful. You fast in order for God to hear you. Let me say again that if you're in any kind of willful disobedience, you need to deal with that in your fast. In your spiritual fast, you need to stop feeding your flesh. Your flesh gets more and more powerful when you give it what it wants. That's what it means, right? Don't give it what it wants. Deny it. Show God you're serious about being a disciple of Christ, which means a learner and a follower of Christ. Show Him that you're serious about this. Don't just uh, fast like a hypocrite. He says they hatch adder's eggs and weave the spider's web. And he that eateth of their eggs dieth. That which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. Their webs shall not become garments. Well, a web doesn't cover up much, but he's talking about man's works. Your works have to be a garment. According to the bride, her bright and shining garment was the righteous acts of the saints. And here they don't have enough righteous acts to cover them. Neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Desolation and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not. And there is no justice in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein doth not know peace. So, saints, the moral of this story is basically repent, believe, fast, and pray. God will hear you. Amen. Well, Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this day and this study. We ask, Lord, that you, that you have mercy upon your saints who have needs and that you reveal to them the thing that's hindering their needs. Uh, just as your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and reveal this to your people, Lord, so that they may receive their needs answered and the needs of those around them answered. We ask this, Father, in the name of Jesus. For more information and materials, go to www.americaslastdays.com.